Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I am Thutin Thon Angka Metagon. I work here at the Legal Officer on behalf of the Electronic Transaction Development Agency, or EDA. I would like to welcome you all to the roundtable on Digital Economy for Our Future. Today, we have the honor from Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, to be a keynote speaker. We also have guest speakers from leading international agency and policymakers from public and private sectors who take part in implementing digital economy to join this roundtable. At the moment, may I invite Mrs. Sulankana Yupap, the CEO of EDA, to deliver a speech. Excellency Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Speaker, and all participants of the forum, gives me great pleasure to extend to you all a welcome on behalf of Electronic Transaction Development Agency, or ETA, and to say how grateful we are to the Deputy, Prime Minister, and distinguished speaker who have accepted our invitation to convene this high-level roundtable on digital economy for our future. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, ETA is a public organization to promote secure electronic transactions in Thailand in order to enhance the national economic growth and quality of life. EDA engages itself building a trusted environment for a digital economy, including cybersecurity, standard, and laws. We have Thailand Computer Emergency Response Team, or ThaiCert, for responding cyber threat in Thailand, and we have ICT Law Center for undertaking legal research and law reform. During the past few months, we supported ICT Ministry and the Deputy Prime Minister to propose 10 digital economy-related bills which are on the way to the National Legislative Assembly. EDA is also assigned to create and enhance opportunity for digital entrepreneurs as well as government services and trades. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the main reason that draw us to today even is to lay a a firm foundations of digital economy in Thailand. We are fortunate to have leaders and policy drivers with us to share their knowledge and perspective on this issue. I would like to thank Excellency Deputy Prime Minister for your present and contribution as a keynote speaker. I would like to also show my appreciation to Honorable Speaker from Overseas. Thank you, Ms. Andrea Mewood. Hagrid, Director General of the International Institute of Communication, or IIC. Jeremy Olivier, 
Head of Multimedia of the Office of Communication or Ofcom, and Lavin from Google Asia Pacific, and Nerida O'Loughlin, Deputy Secretary of the Australian Department of Communication. I would also like to thank the speakers, Mr. Somprasong Bunyachai, President of Intouch Group and AIS, Mr. Lars X. Nocklin, CEO of DTAX, Mr. Wichau, Rakpong Pairod, COO of True, and Mr. Tuilab, Rutta Pirom, Executive Board of the Bank, Bangkok Bank. I would also like to thank all participants for joining us today. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to invite His Excellency Mamrachwong Prediyathorn Terakun, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, to give keynote speech, Your Excellency. Good afternoon, distinguished speakers and guests and friends, as I see a lot of familiar faces. As the Deputy Prime Minister who is in charge of Thailand's uh, economic policy, I am delighted that at this round table, we have experts from various international agencies who have expertise in digital economy. We are also fortunate to have local experts who are policy makers to share their valuable ideas. This round is not a round table, it's a square table. This square table will create a good and cooperative forum for the participants to discuss and look forward to the future of digital economy together. Nowadays, we are in the digital era whereby everything around us is digitally connected. We used to call it Internet of Things. Now, it has evolved into Internet of Everything now. Thailand cannot avoid this evolution of rolling into the digital market. Therefore, the current government announced digital economy as its national agenda and launched digital economy, economy framework in order to enable Thailand's economy growth and enhance the quality of life at the same time. ICT has been implemented and developed in Thailand for over 20 years. However, we have a big agenda to be pondered as to how we can have more benefit from our investment in ICT. One way that we can do this is to analyze what Thailand requires for the development under digital economy. The other way is to learn from the experience of other countries. The other countries in the region have driven their economy under the digital economy policy and made this matter as one of their national top priority agenda. Today, we have a good opportunity that we have experts from Europe, Australia, and the United States to share their valuable experiences and expertise on interesting issues such as digital single market. Many parts of the world now fo focus on, di on the digital single market. As we are in the world where everyone is interconnected, the digital single market already exists. However, there are physical barriers among indi individual countries in implementing digital market strategies. For example, the European Union has, its, has this initiative as part of its digital agenda to be achieved in the year 2020. In transforming Thailand towards digital economy, several initiatives are to be undertaken. The National Digital Economy Commission led by the Prime Minister has already kicked off its works in making policies and strategies under the digital economy. Thailand's strategies are to develop five key elements for digital economy, which are hard infrastructure, 
soft infrastructure, services infrastructure, digital innovation, and society and knowledge. In hard infrastructure, it is important to ensure people access to broadband. For, for this, the government has recently initiated the National Broadband and Data Center Project. With soft infrastructure, we need to accelerate development in legal framework, standards, and security. Our major challenge is how to enforce security protection in the cross-border electronic commerce. For services infrastructure, there is a need to formulate government service, e-government services to promote a digital society. However, to succeed in all of these requires capacity development. Despite of fast changes in technology, Thailand are in need of human development. In all levels, we need to improve internet literacy to ensure fair and equal benefits from digital economy. We also need to enhance capacity of digital entrepreneurs in order to drive innovation and growth. With a lot of focus on technology advancement, we must not forget that the major setback to digital development is the digital divide. In Thailand, it is the main problem we all need to solve together now. To look into the future of Thailand, the cooperation between the private and public sectors must be strengthened. Experiences of the private sector will help drive Thailand's economy to be ready to compete with other countries. I strongly believe that the success of digital economy in Thailand is derived from the collaboration of the private sector that leads the digital-driven economy and the public sector that plays the role of facilitator. The key word to that success is cooperation, as we have joined our hands and worked together for the future outlook of Thailand. The early project that we have started on the National Data Broadband, Data Center, and uh, many others is really based on this future cooperation. We will not do it alone by the government or the private sector, but we jointly do it and the most important thing is that it will be managed by private uh, talent. Because if it we allow the, I'm not saying bad for the government, but if we allow the state enterprise concept to do it, we will never catch up in other countries. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all distinguished speakers and participants for being here. We have great contributions from various leading organizations. To name a few, IIC, Ofcom, CRTC, Google, Department of Communications, Australia, from Australia. We, have, we also have with us leading organizations in Thailand, ranging from DTAC, AIS, True, Bank of Thailand, commercial banks, digital content, and e-commerce communities, and other related sectors. A good show of unity indeed. Thank you very much. I would just add a little bit. The event today is the start of the meaningful dialogues under the leadership of Edda by the godmother named Surang Khanna. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank you, Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister. Next session will be a discussion to exchange views and experience of guest speakers. May I give the floor to Professor Sutham Yunaitham and Ms. Andrea Millwood Hagrave.
speaker into three groups. The, the first group will be our foreign expert who have been coming a long way. The second group will be our kind of first group discussion, which will be Kun Sompasong, Kun Wichar, and Kun Noling. And then the dialogue will be rolling on. So uh, let me not to delay your time. Um, allow me to introduce Ms. Andrea Mibutakrev, the one who made this all happen. Um, she like to give a small presentation. By the way, uh, we have the, the presentation over there. We also broadcast YouTube live, and also we have Twitter. All the key issues will be published, and we will receive comments from public as well. So this is the, the first thing we do in Thailand. This is, this is a, close, a close meeting, but it is public also. But issue, I think we say, she will talk about that later. We will try to apply the Chatham House rules, the, the rules for meeting. So, Andrea, please. Thank you very much. Um, your ex Thank you. <laughs> your Excellency colleagues, we're in the Think Big meeting room, which is rather exciting. Um, I think the rule that um, uh, Ajahn Sudharam was talking about is the Chatham House rule, which means that you can report what was being said, but you don't attribute that. And it is something that the IIC uses a lot because we find, and I hope you'll all participate very fully, we find that it allows people to say things that they would feel uncomfortable saying when they belong to a particular organization, but they have their own, own views, or maybe their organization's views, but don't necessarily want it attributed. Um, just very quickly about the IIC, we've been going for an awfully long time. Um, as one of my colleagues here keeps saying, I'm very young about himself. I'm very young. I wasn't there at its founding. Um, but in fact, the IIC has been converged since the early 1970s uh, when it brought in telecommunications, having been a broadcasting originated sector. And that's because it believed in the power of mass communications and it realized telecommunications was mass. Um, we run a series of events, we have an annual conference, we're about to have our 46th annual conference. We have closed meetings of regulators, um, and this year we're in Washington DC being hosted by the FCC. And we have a series of smaller meetings, and we've just had a bespoke meeting uh, in Bangkok, which has been hosted by the NBTC, looking at ASEAN broadcasting regulation, um, so across the region. And we also produce a journal. Um, I was amused looking at your uh, introductory presentation because it, I almost didn't want to say anything actually because um, you talk about the digital ecosystem and that's actually what I prefer to call it. Um, it's too late to change your title because I'm sure all the branding's been done but I wanted to say that it's not just about the economy. When we talk about the economy we often think just about financial issues and in fact your presentation showed it goes beyond that. Um, and what I'd like to say is it really is about something that is much broader, um, which is about careful management of available resources, which include finance, of course that does, but it also includes the workforce, social cohesion, social capital, and competitiveness on the world stage, which is something that you talked about. Uh, the OECD th talks about three blocks um, within the digital ecosystem. Uh, they are the building blocks, the framework conditions, and socioeconomic um, objectives. And I'd just like to talk very briefly about each of these. Um, infrastructure, and you had a very interesting division of the way in which you talked about hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure. And I think this is partly of what, what I'm talking about. You do need to have spectrum policies um, that allow the efficient use of spectrum, not just spectrum policies that are out there with redundant spectrum or spectrum that's not being used. It's not about finance, it's not about putting money necessarily, if I can say that in this place, into um, the coffers of the government um, and acquisition, but it is about spectrum that allows digitization. Um, it allows the development of high speed networks, both fixed and wireless. And you need high speed to allow access and transfer of bits and bytes and they are key to convergence. So you do need spectrum and you need to have good solid spectrum policy. And then the networks of course are the core or the backbone of any digital system. So there's no point in having something that's wireless without having a backbone, without having other infrastructure. And competition is very important, um, particularly the terms of networks. 
And one of the policy considerations I think that you need to have um, is, of course, financing. And in some countries, you talked about public, we talk about public-private financing, and you talked about cooperation and facilitation by the government. Um, in some countries, there's government funding, and perhaps we'll come on to talk about that um, with some of our other speakers. But we also need to think about rural and urban divisions and reducing inequalities. And of course, the mixture of fixed and mobile helps to do that. Then the framework conditions are what builds on the blocks. So content. And Tom, um, who's here from the CRTC, says that his chairman says content is king, but the consumer is emperor. So of course, content is the driver for digital take up. Um, the creative industry is very important. In the United Kingdom, the creative industry has burgeoned on the back of digitization. Um, and a lot of current content um, is moving on to online content as well and, and programming being made for online content. Games is a very good example of that. Advertising is important. It's growing. It's small, but it's growing. And local content. And again, we come back to social inequalities, the digital divide, bringing people together. It's a way of people being, being able to access their own communities. Um, in terms of competition, um, there are internet intermediaries. They have access to the networks. They have access to different areas like search, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about. Um, but also there are issues around um, smart data, smart applications, big data. Who has the modules in the cars? Is there competition when you're talking about developing policies for those sorts of things? Public services, um, government services have been very, very important. Um, E-government, e-health, you've showed examples of those things. And we all know the story about the, the farmer in the market, you know, who's able to look at what the market price is going to be and how he's going to sell his product forward. Um, applications and smarter technologies we know about M2M um, machine to machine, and I mentioned smart cars and smart fridges and things like that. But there are a lot of green initiatives, and they're becoming more and more important on the global stage. So those are also smarter technologies. And I talked about interna international stature here, international access, and I've put down here rather crudely to eyeballs, but it's actually raising your profile um, as a country and actually having your place on a world stage which I think is very important, um, particularly in a region like this, in fact. Um, and then there are, of course, the socioeconomic objectives. Um, there is the financial objective. Um, you know, you, many of you here have businesses that you want to run. You have countries that you want to put forward and put onto the world stage. But you also want to increase your diversified workforce to be able to have jobs for them, skills for them. Um, you will have an increasingly educated society within a digital um, ecosystem because you don't have to have those divides about different types of access to education. Increasing ability to interconnect and, I'd argue, reducing uh, inequalities. But there are challenges. Um, certainly in the West, post-Snowden, cybersecurity is a very big issue. There is national security as is an issue. Hacking is... Um, costing a lot of money to many governments and many companies, of course. Um, and there needs to be the balance between a free and open internet and national concerns and national protections. Um, there is an issue about privacy. Um, my data, it's being monetized. Who's getting the money from it? What is the trade-off? Um, what are the benefits? And certainly we've done work which has shown that people are quite happy to give quite a lot of information out for having something that is free in return, such as Facebook. Is there enough awareness? And I'll come on to that. Um, and then there are issues around digital identity management, which is very important for government, particularly in, in people, governments that hold your, your data. Consumer protection. Um, we talked earlier upstairs about spam. Um, the Consumer protection in terms of business to consumer and industry is of increasing importance. Uh, and in China, we find that business to consumer industry, the B2C industry as it's called, is growing at 80% over a large number of years, year on year. 
and citizen empowerment, um, because I actually think of the internet as a very good thing. So though I talk about challenges, it's actually a very good thing and you need to educate and you need to empower your citizens to use it. Um, so it is easy to use. You need to make sure that people can feel safe, that they can trust what they do. And you talked about e-commerce. So it's building safe online and mobile payment systems. It's reducing concerns, putting in me place measures for identity theft and concerns about that, and allowing people to make better choices. And then finally, investment, not just the fact that you're being asked possibly to pay for it, but actually the whole issue around cross-border um, issues. So the internet is global, it's truly global, it does cross borders. And Jeremy will come, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, will talk about the digital single market. In Europe, we have a real problem. I can order something in Belgium, but I can't easily have it delivered. I think Belgium's probably a bad example because of Amazon. I can order something in Germany, but I can't easily have it develop, um, delivered to me in UK without paying extra taxes. So there does need to be some sort of cross-border um, uh, agreement, and you have it with APAC or you have it with the AEC, and you need to work that through. And I'm, I'm not sure Europe's got it right. So I think maybe the fact that there are issues to be raised is what you should be looking at, the issues. Um, I've talked already about the trust. Um, what I think is quite interesting um, is the way that the system is being developed. Um, in Europe, there are a number of industry government forums. Um, there is something called the Strategic Policy Forum on Digital Entrepreneurship. And that has a number of areas that working groups that look at different areas. I think that is also very interesting. There is mentoring, actual industry coming together with people to build skills, to build capacity, to help them understand what they, they need to do. And it might be placements, it can be all sorts of different things. And of course, there's awareness building. And I talked about trust and, and um, increasing skills. That requires money. So you do need to be able to reach people and tell them what the digital ecosystem can bring to them and why it's important. Um, today, Tom, I'm quoting you again, um, called Broadband Technologies, the brush that paints the digital landscape. And I thought that was absolutely right. That says it for me. It's actually about broadband technology and then it's what you build on top of it. Um, the digital economy sits at about 8% of GDP in the G20 um, countries. So it is very important. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, as I say, I represent the IIC, and what I'd like to do now is go straight on to um, introduce you to my colleagues. Um, Jeremy Olivier from Ofcom, I think, will speak first. And then Anne Levin from Google, who is based in Singapore. Uh, Narida McLaughlin, who is from Australia, from the Department of Communications. And Tom says he won't speak, but I'm sure we'll be able to persuade him to at some stage. And he represents Canada. And please, um, I'm sure my colleagues will join me in saying, please do ask questions um, as we go through. We're very happy to, to answer any questions, or indeed to challenge us, because I'm, I'm sure we're happy for that to happen too. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Digital Single Market Initiative is a set of 16 uh, kind of policy initiatives just set out by the European Commission whose purpose is really to drive forward the digital single market within Europe. And that means two things. Firstly, it means digital individual economies and critically uh, it also means cross-border, uh, enabling a greater degree of cross-border activity, making Europe, making Europe uh, as I said, into a digital single market. To some extent, uh, the themes of the digital single market, I think, are directly relevant also to individual nation states thinking about how to create digital economies. And I'll mention the, the, those of the digital single market themes, which I think are most relevant uh, briefly for that purpose. The second thing uh, that I was asked to talk about was uh, broadband infrastructure policy or broadband policy. Now, strictly speaking, uh, this is a government matter, and I'm not a representative government of, of, the, of the UK government, but I can talk a little bit about the way that we in the UK have approached, uh, approached broadband 
uh, through a kind of complementary package of uh, competition measures uh, and some direct investment with the state. And I'll talk about how, uh, how that's worked and what I think is important about it. So first of all, the uh, digital single market. As I said, it's a broad kind of portfolio of initiatives in intended to enable uh, uh, eco um, the digital economy to operate more effectively. Among the ones I think are perhaps most important and relevant, I would cite first of all the uh, overall review of uh, legislation of regulations that cover both the telecommunications sector in Europe, as known as the electronic communications framework, and the uh, the media sector, the review of the audiovisual media services directive. Now, in both cases, those create a pan-European uh, regulatory environment. Uh, one which is intended to foster competition, but also to enable businesses to operate across multiple territories within the, reason, within the region in ways which are common, in ways which are clearly understood uh, and do not involve multiple regulatory regimes. There are also, within those two frameworks, protections for individual businesses which want to operate across, uh, across multiple territories that in some circumstances you are effectively protected as a provider of, for example, broadcast services established in the UK. So far as Europe is concerned, you are established and regulated everywhere in Europe by your home state. That's a very important kind of uh, a pillar of, of the operation of the market. So those are the two core frameworks, telecommunications and um, audiovisual media. The second really important theme I think I'd like to draw attention to is that of uh, consumer protection. Now, consumer protection is clearly at the heart of effective uh, digital economy. And indeed, I understand from talking to your colleagues, that's a big theme of the work of uh, this institution already. I cannot emphasize enough how, how critical it is. The focus of the digital single market in relation to consumer protection is kind of threefold. Some degree of harmonization, of the consumer protection framework across the whole uh, across the whole European market, but interestingly, I think, and also importantly, measures intended to make more effective and easy cross-border transactions. Uh, so more rules for cross-border trade, and lastly, a new framework to enable cross-border cooperation in enforcement of those consumer protection frameworks. So each of these measures kind of complement one another to create an environment in which consumers are potentially more trusting, more confident as they engage with, uh, with e-commerce providers. Two, uh, kind of two further of the 16 to which I'd like to, to draw attention. Now, firstly, there's a major review of the uh, privacy framework. In fact, that's substantially complete and is in the final stage of uh, legislative negotiation now between the Commission uh, and, and the European Parliament. And that seeks to strike a new and fair balance between the interests of, uh, the interests of industry, who want to benefit from uh, uh, consumers' data, to gather it, to exploit it, to use it to deliver new services to consumers, and the rights consumers have to basic privacy, and critically, to understand and to give appropriate consent to the gathering and exploitation of data about them by businesses who in return will deliver valuable services to those consumers. So that's privacy. And then the final uh, one, I think it kind of draws directly on what Andrea was saying, is some specific legislation intended to reduce the burden faced by cross-border businesses from different VAT and other kind of tax frameworks. That is also perceived as a, a significant barrier. Actually, there's one I forgot to mention, the last one, which is, of course, looking at parcels delivery. Uh, Andrea also mentioned uh, issues in the uh, ease and effectiveness of pan-European digital economy activity that der derives from the operation and very different pricing arrangements that you see for parcels delivery within, and within individual countries and across uh, across borders. So it's a very brief tour through, I think, what are the salient parts of the, uh, the digital single market uh, from which there may be, may be lessons that can be drawn. Right, as I said, I also want to talk very briefly 
about uh, infrastructure policy. And I want to emphasize again, infrastructure policy is the government's and not Ofcom's. But what I can say is that Ofcom, we believe, has played a, sim a significant part in the development of the UK's infrastructure in, and in the rollout and take up of broadband and high-speed broadband services through our interventions in the market whose purpose is to enable competition. So there are a number of very significant interventions that Ofcom has made in the, the broadband marketplace. About just under a decade ago, I think, we introduced a model of structural separation for the core telecoms provider, which uh, positioned, although within a single business, very clearly divided operating structures for the retailers of electronic communication services, and perhaps most importantly, internet access, and for the business developing, investing in the, the core infrastructure. Local loop unbundling is one instance of this model of separation and mandated access to, to infrastructure. But local loop unbundling has evolved in the UK. We, in uh, the UK, Ofcom introduced what was, I think, a new regulatory framework, certainly within Europe, uh, called VULA, which is a virtual unbundled local loop. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the detail, but essentially, the way that um, fibre infrastructure works, there is no physical model through which the uh, unbundling that applied to copper can be replicated. And therefore, we introduced a new intervention with a virtual unbundled intervention, which was intended to maintain the competitive benefits that derive from allowing multiple vendors of retail internet access services to use one single core, uh, core access network. So, shall I say it again? Yes. yes. So, okay, I can I can talk. I'm le functional separation was some time ago, um, but the, the the core theme is that you separate the operations of the infrastructure business from the retailing of uh, electronic communication services such as internet access. It's not a model that we see in the U.S. and and we've been surprised. We felt it's a very important part of delivering good quality infrastructure. So you have an infrastructure business and retail businesses, and you have market or competition frameworks that allow other operators to access some or all of the infrastructure owned by the infrastructure business. And by functionally separating the infrastructure and the retail business, you create incentives for the infrastructure business to invest to benefit not only its own or part of the same group's retail businesses, but also third party retail vendors of internet access or telephony, telephony services. So, so may, may I ask some silly question on this digital single market? It's not about digital, it's about a single market, okay? Uh, Payment, sy uh, payment system is very, uh, you know, important feature of the single market anyway. Uh, do you accommodate, you know, various currencies or you use euro as a main payment system only? And will Greek be finally be allowed to join this single, digital <laughs> single market? Uh, that's a, a really a, an issue of, of um, uh, macroeconomic policy on which I, I, I don't have uh, I don't have a view. I don't know if anybody here from anybody here from the banking sector would like to comment on where they see the respective roles of the euro and of the other currencies in allowing digital single market transactions. I'm afraid I cannot say. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, would you mandate access and oh, I'm sorry. You mandate access and the terms and conditions of that access? Uh, it depends. So as not to create redundancy by deploying 
multiple fibers to the premises? Yes, in essence, the answer to your question is yes, there is, uh, there is mandatory access. And the model I was describing... In the terms of conditions? Uh, Vula actually sets out okay. uh, uh, the kind of framework, sets the conditions. Um, I'm not, I don't believe that it is price regulated, but I, I don't know. Off the top of my head. How do you assure that you're incenting the facilities-based incumbent provider to invest in fibre? Those incentives exist in virtue of the opportunity they have to sell those fibre services, but, and this is what makes uh, it a kind of competition-focused model, to sell those fibre services not only to the incumbent uh, retailer of internet access, BT in both cases, but also to third party, to all the third party ISPs. I think what we see in the, in the UK, actually it's, it's become a more concentrated market with around 80% with around 88% held by the biggest four providers. But even so, 88% of the biggest four providers with only a third held also by the incumbent is still, in my view, quite a well-segmented market for internet access, given that there are only really two uh, core operators of infrastructure in the form of the cable network and the incumbent telco. And if you did not mandate this access, would that be provided freely by the incumbent investor? Uh, I'm afraid I don't know, but we have, so it is. Sorry. Well, if you have, it's because they probably would not have invested and would not have allowed um, third parties to ride their network. But they wouldn't have allowed third parties to. I would, in principle, we would not have expected, without access uh, obligations, for third party retailers of uh, communication services to have access to that core network. And because there are multiple retailers, potentially, then there are better drivers of demand right. from, on, on the retail side, a better competition and to buy services. It would also be an inefficient spend to have more than one fiber, given the capacity is, is unlimited for all intents and purposes. Yes, right? Sir. One question, is, is the regulation working? Uh, are retailers actually coming on? to the fiber infrastructure, or is it mainly uh, BT that's still using the fiber infrastructure? No, no, I, I'm afraid I have not brought data, but uh, I think uh, our belief is that the, um, there are quite a few resellers of the um, core uh, BT fiber network, and among the, the kind of two principal resellers, Talk Talk and Sky, I, I'm confident they have a, a good comparable or proportionate market share in the fight in ultra high speed or in high speed broadband to that they have in standard um, unbundled DSL but no data to hand I'm afraid uh, the last thing I wanted to say uh, is just that of course notwithstanding all of these measures notwithstanding competition intervention there will always be some areas of the country for which uh, commercial incentives uh, alone will not um, justify investment uh, in, uh, particularly in, in high-speed broadband. There's a very low-level universal service obligation, but the UK government is currently investing, um, the sums seem uh, differently reported, but at least half a billion pounds in rolling out uh, higher-speed infrastructure to those small areas of the country where there is no uh, commercial economic case for uh, investment. And it's set two um, targets. One is that uh, uh, 24 megabits a second should be available to 90% of UK homes by uh, 2016, and that that should get to 95% by, uh, by 2017. And that's where government investment filling in the gap, but with very clearly defined uh, hurdles in terms of demonstrating that the, uh, the investment, that public subsidy is necessary for the infrastructure to be built out to those uh, territories. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say about broadband infrastructure. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much for this opportunity to come speak. It's a bit daunting. Um, I'm really going to go and cover two areas. Um, one is I just want to briefly bring attention to a very interesting report. 
and then I will talk a little bit about uh, data-driven innovation. Um, but well, I want to talk about this report, and a consulting firm, TRPC, put together this report. It's, it's an interesting look at developing the digital economy. It's focusing on Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So it gives you a wide variety of development sort of price point. Um, and it has case studies, and it draws some broad conclusions and some narrow. And I think it's really interesting. I'm just going to touch on some things about it. But it will be easily found um, by using Google and putting <laughs> TRPC, digital economy. Work out very well for you. Um, so uh, you know, among the things it does is it talks about the building blocks of a digital economy, what the key elements are, you know, what sort of measures it. Um, in goes in great detail of how these work in the, in the different countries. And then really focusing on the success factors. And I think that here in, in Thailand, over the last uh, six months, there's been a lot of discussion about some of these very same things. So I think to some degree, the report validates the great work that's gone on here. And in some cases, it says, oh, maybe we should look a little more here or a little less there. So I think it's, it's quite interesting and useful. And then it finally wraps up with some interesting policy recommendations. Of course, I have, you know, I think it's really useful. I mean, vision, this is what today and so much else that's going on in Thailand is about. Um, and of course, you know, I have a natural bias towards uh, transparency and sort of smart uh, regulation. And the idea that being incredibly careful in regulation, that you're providing the protections that also build the confidence that let the digital ecosystem <coughs> build, while, but also creating the space for it to adapt. You know, five years ago, we wouldn't have expected many of the things that go on today on the internet and in the digital economy. They just weren't part of our thought processes. And what you don't want to do is limit those kinds of, um, of steps forward. And of course, regulatory harmonization, both within the country and across borders, because you know, what this digital economy does is make things so, so much more uh, borderless. You know, and then I think also going on the extra step to saying, how do you really incentivize this behavior? How do you incentivize the growth of the ecosystem? And there are so many different ways. But how can, you know, should in different sectors be looking for at tax incentives or other kinds, other kinds of incentives and other kinds of partnerships. But this is just a very quick overview of what I think is an interesting report. And it's frankly what I wanted to talk about. And now I will be obedient and talk about what I'm supposed to talk about. So um, I'm going to go is really data-driven innovation. And you know, it's a charming buzzword, right, that allows us to explore really using, using data in a smart way to really benefit you know, governments and SMEs and big businesses and NGOs and universities. But I think the big point to make in this is data is just data. It's data. And in and of itself, it has little value. And it's the human process of innovating with it and coming up with a service and product that matters. And I also want to make the point that it doesn't need to be what somebody called big data. Frankly, you can innovate with little chunks of data, very narrowly focused data as well. And so that's really important. So what I want to do is give you a few um, examples of different kinds of data driven innovation. So uh, here's a little example from a startup, a Singapore-based startup that's done an uh, app called Migraine Buddy. So the idea is to help people with migraines. And so on one level, as a user of the app, you would be entering data about your experiences during the day. Um, and then the app on your phone would also be capable of capturing other data, like your amount of physical activity, how many hours you slept. Now, that's giving you data, giving data for your personal use. Um, it may help you adjust new medications. It, tell the eff efficacy. All those things are true. Uh, but at the same time, it's with the user's permission, obviously, gathering and depersonalizing other data, which allows the app to make some broader conclusions. 
So a conclusion it made, probably not shocking, is that uh, getting less than seven hours sleep for many, many people helps trigger migraines. So not only is that validated, but it can also say, um, you know, you're edging into the danger zone for your upcoming migraine because you're not sleeping. But it's providing this whole range of information that's serving a broader purpose on what affects broadly, but for people personally. Um, then, you know, this is a little more, uh, a, much, a very Google example on sort of the big picture. Um, you know, uh, when our Android phones, we have something called Now Cards. This evolved when our engineers working on maps said, you know, given what we may know with your permission about where you are, what might you want to know? Odds are, if I want weather information, I want it where I am. Bangkok. Now, yesterday I came from Singapore here. Yesterday, my now cards showed me weather in Bangkok, because it knew where I was going, and in Singapore. Uh, it also, because it knows where I'm going, and it has access to traffic information, sent me a little ping yesterday afternoon saying, it's time for you to go to the airport now, because the, tra the traffic is like this on, on the CTE, and it's raining. So you're going to leave a little bit earlier. And those are useful things to me. Um, and they, you know, hopefully useful to other people too. Then I want to say that, you know, governments and city councils, and there's obviously thousands of ways we can think about this. But I want to talk about a case in New York City because it was a combination of information really quickly. They have a big problem with drains um, and systems being blocked with grease that, you know, restaurants dump. And how do you catch those guys? Because the poor, limited number of you know, government servants who are trying to catch people is very small. The problem's very big. What they did is they laid over restaurants on a map. Then, because in New York, this kind of uh, oil waste can only be collected by licensed collectors, they laid over the contract information. And then they laid over the blockage information. And by doing that, they could say, oh, that neighborhood over there, that's the problem. That's, and they could, push their, um, they could push their focus there. Now, you know, 63% of the blo blocks of drains in New York City are caused by these uh, cooking oil leakages. Um, as a result of doing this, they are now catching 95% of the people who are legally dumping. And um, that has a chilling effect on illegal dumpers. So it's, it's been a you know, useful thing. Laying, but it's you know a creative use of looking in the geospatial. Then you know farmers. So I'm going to use a New Zealand example. Um, they say that you know uh, 14 day 14 days is the difference between success and failure in farming. Did you plant? Did you fertilize? Did you do whatever you did? So there's a an app with a program called Farmax, and this program uh, allows you to model. So Traditionally, farmers were reliant on experience and intuition. But experience and intuition aren't always perfect. And, um, and we live in a world where things get infinitely more complex. Um, and so more complicated. So this allows farmers to model, say, if I do this today, here's what the outcome in terms of my yield will be, putting in all sorts of factors about the animals I have, the weather that's upcoming, all you know, the amount of acreage I'm working on, and then say, oh, well, here would it be at seven days from now, or 14. And by modeling it, they make better decisions. So because I am numerically challenged always. So what they said is that the average per he hectare or gross margin for sheep and beef farms using this Farmax is 70% higher than non-users. So that's a really giant margin. And because of the wealth of data it's collected, it's now able to predict yields within 3% margin of error, which is pretty impressive. But it allows much, much clearer and better outcomes. Um, but what this is all about is, right, there's a growing volume of data. And you know, when I, in talking about, right, now we've just talked about machine, in my examples, machine-generated data about sleep and movement, personally-generated data and migraine, right? Uh, you know, broader general data that's been collected and then um, from outside sources and users in the farm apps. 
all these different kinds of data. But the fact is there's just a massive amount of data out there. But data is like light, right? It's a resource that if I stand in the light and take advantage of it, I'm not taking your light from you. And so it's, it's a con it's, it's, it fuels innovation, it fuels parts of the economy, but my use of data doesn't necessarily deny someone else's use. But the fact is that there's so much data out there, these different kinds of data. But the fact is there's just a massive amount of data out there. But data is like light, right? It's a resource that if I stand in the light and take advantage of it, I'm not taking your light from you. And so it's, it's a con it's, it's, it fuels innovation, it fuels parts of the economy, but my use of data doesn't necessarily deny someone else's use. But the fact is that there's so much data out there. And so, um, and we need to focus on the innovation part of it. You know, um, so until the year 2000, the total amount of data in the world was 12 exabytes. And I can only imagine the mass how massive an exabyte is, you know, beyond comprehension. But the fact is that today, the world creates two exabytes of data every day. So it's just the, the growth is there, but it's what, it's what we do with it, right? So, um, you know, as we say, raw data is like sand is to silicon chips. I mean, in and of itself, it's nothing. So it's, it's how to use it wisely, and that's the key, and that requires a lot of things. It requires training people to learn how to use it wisely, it learns experimenting with using it wisely, and we have to do it smartly. So I'll give a couple quick examples. Google Translate. So, you know, while Translate really works is you have sort of largely identical data in two different languages and you can compare them. And over time you have more and more of this data and you compare more of it. And then the machine learns how to make, you know, further conclusions and better. And so Translate gets, the truth is Translate gets better with every, but every use of it. Now, and so it's, Frankly, in, in many languages, and in Europe in particular, it works uh, stunningly well. In fact, right, we, we've, Google's partnered with the European Patent Office to translate patents into 28 European languages, as well as Chinese and Russian and Japanese and Korean. And so that works really well. But the truth is that not all languages have that great corpus of comparative content. And unfortunately, Thai doesn't have the comparative corpus that we wish it would. And plus, let's just say Thai is really hard to translate. And so to begin with. Um, so you have machine learning, which is really important, and that's really data-driven innovation. But then you have to do it, find ways to do it in scale and solve. One of the things we have done in Thailand, and actually across many countries in Southeast Asia, is uh, do something called Love Your Language. It's basically an app. We recruit people and train them on it. It lets people put in key phrases. And fortunately, much more the kind of phrases normal people use in normal life in the proper translations. And then has a whole network of other people who are volunteering and you know, love of language to validate them. And it's the group validation that makes it work. And I think it's particularly important. We need to create more great Thai content for Thailand but we also want to make sure that Thais have access to the content that exists in other languages. But I think very, very important is this translate tool going the other direction because we want people in the rest of the world to actually be able to look at great Thai created content and make it understandable to them in their languages. And then finally, my last little bit, I promise, um, about the, inter the real Internet of Things. You know, the Internet of Things, you know, just thing things being connected to the internet. That's great. I mean, you know, I am delighted if my phone can turn my lights on and off. It makes my life a little bit easier. I like it if it can turn my TV on and off, terrific. But to me, that's cool, but it's not excitingly innovative. And um, convenient to me, but is it a big benefit? So I wanna talk just a second about Nest. Now this is a company that Google bought in the last year. Um, one of the things it does is build smart thermostats. So you say, that's great, right? Easy to program, it learns about when my 
things are when I want my house hot or cold. Great. But in many places, it's doing much more. So in many localities, local utilities actually pay people to put nest in their home. And they create a partnership where the utilities, you know, has a lot of sunk costs being able to provide power at peak times. And it's very costly. It's very inefficient for them. But by partnering with consumers and using Nest, they can, using all sorts of information to pool at a better time of the day for the, for the load on the system, to you know, do all these things in this way, which results in increased energy efficiency, saves money for consumers, and saves money for the big utility, which is able to pass it on to consumers. And so that's sort of a real innovative approach to using the tech to do that. So um, the, you know, the point to make, as I think has been made and almost everyone said today, is that you know, all, everything about this, uh, the digital ecosystem, the digital economy, is about borderless nature. And that's really true with anything around data-driven innovation, allowing the data to move. So just want to say very quickly, right, you know, these are the real points to keep in mind, that you need this data to be able to flow. Of course, none of that matters. I would never ar ar argue for the free flow of data unless it can be ensured that we have privacy and security involved. And unless we have private and security involved, it just doesn't matter. And that we need to think about how to do this. We need to think about sharing the information. Um, I want to mention that I think public sector data in particular, we need to be able to get out there to people and make it useful and let people innovate with that. And that, of course, none of this is going to work unless people really understand data literacy, data analytics, and how to do this work. So I went through a lot of stuff quickly. You know, I hope it leaves an opportunity to talk. And I really am so grateful for the opportunity to talk today. Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, the CEO of ETA, it's a very great honour to be here this afternoon to, to discuss um, Australia's policies. And I'd like to actually acknowledge the leadership of the Government of Thailand in bringing together business um, and, and government to talk about such an important issue to all our economies. Um, so this afternoon I'd like to just give a brief presentation on three key areas. The importance of the digital economy to, to Australia and to our future growth and prosperity. The status of the Australian Government's digital economy strategy and just touch on a couple of relevant um, initiatives that have come to the fore recently from the government, particularly our digital transformation agenda and initiatives to support skills development and innovation. It's fair to say that Australians love technology um, and we've embraced it at a rapid pace. We're a very small country. We have 23 million people, but we already have over 31 million active mobile subscriptions. 76% of adults in Australia access the internet on their mobile phones. Globally, Australia is ranked fourth out of 138 countries on mobile internet penetration, and about 94% of Australian premises have access to fixed wireless and fixed line broadband, although at speeds that we find relatively unacceptable, and hence the Government of Australia has committed to um, a very large investment in national broadband network, which is a ubiquitous wholesale broadband network being built by a government-owned business enterprise. What has happened with the rapid technological innovation evident in Australia? It has resulted in huge structural shifts across the economy and away from what are our traditional strengths in Australia and our traditional industries. For example, in 1900, around about one in four Australians worked in the agriculture sector. In May this year, agriculture accounted for slightly more than 2% of total jobs in the economy. As late as 1970, about, manufacturing accounted for about 28% of the workforce. It now accounts for just over 7% of jobs. So there are risks here, a risk that the significant work, uh, workforce transition is, is not well handed, handled but is demanded by technological innovation. Some of our local researchers in Australia estimate that around about 40% of its workforce, or 5 million jobs, 
are at high risk of being replaced by computers in the next 10 to 15 years. What that doesn't take into account is all the new jobs that will be created by the digital economy, economy. but it does highlight a high risk um, that we need to manage and a significant economic and social risk if we do not adequately prepare for such seismic shifts and changes in the workforce. They all, we all know, though, that there are significant opportunities as well, and those are being seen in Australia already. In 2003, mobile broadband added around about $33.8 billion worth of economic activity in Australia, which was equivalent to just under 3% of GDP. The IMT industry generated $73 billion in sales and service income in 13-14, with internet-related services accounting for over a quarter of that figure. And in this period, around about 56% of, of Australian businesses placed orders via the internet, with 33% of businesses receiving orders via the internet, therefore improving their productivity. My minister, who's the Minister for Communications, the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, at a recent speech earlier this year, pointed out that the key to Australia's future prosperity, our competitiveness and progress, is in large part contingent on our ability to come counter some of the trends and to embrace others. And the Australian government, in response to the minister's challenge, recognises and has been responding continually to the rapid and disruptive nature of the current environment. As the Deputy Prime Minister said earlier, um, governments cannot do it alone, but they can assist by mitigating some risks for business and the community, as well as helping them exploit every opportunity that disruption presents. Australia, uh, the Australian government moved into uh, looking at digital economy strategies quite early. I remember that we were looking at it around about 2000 and working on those soft infrastructure and hard infrastructure issues that you raised earlier. The most recent digital economy strategy was released in 2011. It was updated in 2013 and it's now going through a further update. And that recognises how rapidly things are changing and how rapidly uh, business wants government to do different things for them uh, to assist them in, in their progress. The digital economy strategy in Australia has been a whole of government effort. It's crossed over our health sector, environment, inf infrastructure and education and through to business. Our department has um, run some specific programs for households, for small business and not-for-profits, but there's also been a number of programs right across government to trial things like um, high-speed broadband applications for telehealth and education. And I'll just mention a couple of those uh, this afternoon. The policy is called Advancing Australia as a Digital Economy. And as I mentioned, um, our, my department's main focus was on improving skills and usage by, uh, by small business in particular and not-for-profits. We ran a program called Digital Enterprises which was aimed at improving online presence of small business, allowing them and encouraging them to provide new services. We ran another program called Digital Business Kits and a website, which was about general and industry specific resources to get them um, uh, fully engaged in the digital economy. We also ran programs for local communities. We ran a digital hubs program which had over 85,000 training sessions right across the country. These, these um, uh, policies were, uh, on one hand, um, very much focused on building uh, productivity and business growth. But I'd have to say, though, also for another reason, which was to try and tell the story to the Australian community of what was possible from a national broadband network what was going to be possible in the future to be delivered in communities and to be delivered by businesses of a truly high-speed, um, ubiquitous broadband network. Another example, which was run through our health department, which um, was called the NDS Health Pilots, um, and we found that digital delivery of health services presents a specific opportunity to improve the effectiveness of health and aged care services in the face of Australia's growing ageing population, an issue that I think we all share. 
Our stats show that by 2030, the number of Australians aged over 80 years old is expected to rise by 140%, and chronic diseases and conditions will also increase as people live longer. And in a very big country with a small population that's distributed um, very widely, uh, telehealth actually presents significant opportunities for people, particularly in regional and remote areas, to get city standard services from the healthcare service. So we managed three trials. There are a diverse range of pilots. Uh, they targeted chronic diseases in older Australians, youth mental health, ophthalmology treatment in remote communities. And we've now received those evaluations for many of the pilots and we're evaluating those at the moment. The key findings, as you see on the screen, were that people are willing to engage with the technology for their health services. They do have a preference for face-to-face -face consultation, but if that's not accessible, they will engage online. There are, importantly, improved health outcomes from using these sort of telehealth approaches <coughs> with potential cost savings to the government and to the community. And healthcare providers can be reluctant to embrace the new approach, and that's a real challenge for us, to get healthcare providers up to speed. And we need to look at some sustainability and integration. But they have done what they have set out to do, was really to test and pilot new ways of doing things using high-speed broadband and testing how the government and industry could also use them. So what next? Apart from updating our uh, digital economy uh, strategy, I just want to talk to you about an announcement in the 2015-16 federal budget in May uh, by the government, what, which was a key priority to be advancing its new digital transformation agenda. And what the agenda does is significantly ramp up the government's focus and leadership on transforming government service delivery. It's introducing digital by default for all government service delivery. The government recognises that more efficient government services, along with less regulation, can stimulate business growth and reduce transactional and other costs for households. There have been many good e-government projects in Australia to date, uh, but some of them have been disconnected and the learnings from each of the projects have been disparate. So what the agenda is trying to do is to bring that all together so we can learn from each other, we can share platforms with each other and we can really push forward in transforming government. Um, the government's agenda to overcome this is, um, includes providing very strong leadership at the highest level. The Prime Minister of Australia will chair a cabinet level committee on the agenda with Minister for Communications, the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, as deputy chair. So it's been given very high uh, level leadership across government. For stage one, uh, there was a commitment for 254.7 million Australian dollars over four years uh, for stage one, which I think translates from my notes to about 6.5 trillion Thai baht. I hope that's correct. At the heart of the digital transformation agenda is a new creation called the Digital Transformation Office. And the office will have a number of priorities for 15-16. Um, firstly, the head of the office uh, will be appointed, has been appointed by government. The office was established on the 1st of July this year. Um, and Mr Paul Shetler, who will be well known to my UK colleagues, has been appointed to the role, given his experience in the UK, in driving transformation of government services. There are some groundwork that the office needs to do this year. It's going to develop a digital service standard so that right across government there's a consistent digital design approach from the very beginning of us thinking of digital services and um, services to the community. We'll be de developing a trusted digital identity framework and as Andreas said, digital identities are particularly important for government so that people have easier access by using those identities. Better services. We want to do better services. We're looking at digital mailbox, a tell us once initiative so that when I tell the government once my, my information, I don't have to tell them 20 times my information. I can tell once and it can be used uh, securely and privately across government for all the services that I access. We're also looking at things like voice activation and voice authentication to make it easier for people to get online. 
And one of the key things that we've been doing at Cross Government is looking at grants administration. We all, in Australia, there are a broad range of government departments who provide grants to businesses, local communities, NGOs, not-for-profits. Um, and we do those in quite disparate ways and we want to get some greater efficiency out of that by streamlining and simplifying grants to start off with across 12 major agencies. It's an ambitious agenda for government, really trying to transform government services, but we think that's something that government can do and provide leadership in its own delivery of services that can also be a model for the private sector as well. The government's very committed to the uh, Transformation Office and we look forward to progressing it this year. It's a very exciting initiative for the Australian Government. It's not all that we're doing. There are other new initiatives which were announced in the May budget which I might just uh, touch on. The government has recognised that the skills of the future need to be built now and at the earliest stages of education. So it's therefore committed in the most recent budget to new initiatives at the primary and the secondary school level to increase educational focus on science, technology, engineering and mathematics. This includes a new initiative to introduce coding into the core curriculum in schools and ultimately that will expand the pool of ICT skilled workers in Australia where as I think we all face um, shortages across the board in that area. The government's also listened very carefully to Australian entrepreneurs <coughs> and has introduced a range of initiatives that support them drive innovation in the economy. These include more attractive arrangements for enterprise share schemes, a new for framework for crowdsource funding and changes to tax law to stimulate the flow of venture capital. And finally, I'd just like to touch on and picking up uh, some of the uh, comments from my colleague Anne. I'd like to touch briefly on some of the recent work we've been doing to encourage the release of government data. In government, like every other sector of the economy, mass connectivity is enabling human and machine generated data to amass in ever increasing amounts. In government, from economic statistics to geocoded address information to weather maps to data about real people consuming government services such as family tax benefits and childcare assistance to the energy efficiency of buildings and appliances Governments hold huge amounts of data. What we can't do, though, is build in the innovation of knowing what to do with that data. So what government wants to, to do is release that data to the private sector in a secure, anonymised way, in a way that's um, appropriate for the people who've provided that data to government, and say to industry, what can you make of this? And I think Anne's comments about what industry has done with with data sets is a really good example of that. Australia has made great progress. Earlier this year, we have released uh, around about 6,000 data sets available on data.gov.au. And my department, in partnership with a number of other uh, departments, have also built what we call the National Map, which visually represents geospatial data across land, water, infrastructure, broadband access, and a number of other data sets. In concluding um, my remarks today, I'd just like to again acknowledge the Government of Thailand for the invitation to discuss the Australian digital economy experience with you. I think we have much to learn from each other and as we seek to reap the benefits of the digital economy for our future growth and prosperity in our own countries, in our region and across the world. Thank you very much. Madam, Madam Deputy Secretary, I, I have a question. Uh, my question is on the economic on the economic side. Digital helps uh, improve productivity and reduce cost. Okay, and that's on the supply side, as well as at the same time they improve efficiency of the marketing activities. Both sides contribute to the economic growth. According to your observation from the you know, real experience in Australia, which is more effective? Uh, in, on, is it on the uh, productivity side or is it on the, um, the market efficiency of marketing activity? Which is more productive and help 
lead to the higher growth of the economy? I think I'd observe that there's, there's no one thing that's more important than another. And I think the, the, um, the material you put up early was exactly right about the development of the digital economy requires a whole lot of different interventions and different um, activities by government and business that may range from the educated business to improve productivity. It also ranges through to digital literacy, making sure people know how to use systems, um, you have to have the bedrock right in terms of your security and your privacy settings. So all these things come together. And it's only, I think, when they all gel together that you really can push uh, productivity and growth across the economy. And in our case in Australia, that's required significant infrastructure, infrastructure investment in hard infrastructure. So we've got actually broadband to build the digital economy on. Refresh my question a little bit. Well, you you are introducing a lot of things. Okay, is the on the reduction of productivity side or on the marketing activity side that's uh, more welcome by the private sector? Which which one? Uh, when you in, you are pushing for the you know digital to help reducing uh, the cost or improve productivity, also you producing a lot of digital activities to put an ease on market activities. Which one are more welcome by private sector in your experience? I think where the private sector um, it, it has come to government um, on has been regulatory settings um, to get those right for them and then really to allow them to pursue what they want to do. Um, so government not getting in the way. So providing some support to set the regulatory settings, but also to um, help them um, with issues that they face which may be impediments to them uh, improving their uh, um, productivity and growth through the digital economy. I think also though um, industry has, in Australia at least, called on government to help it inform the community and improve uh, both uh, digital access uh, to make sure that access is is um, as even as possible across the across the community and across businesses, and that's something that business has called on government to do. A lot of times, though, business just want to get government out of the way and pursue business. The reason they ask is because, as I observe in China, uh, when you introduce digital things, they are more effective on the marketing activity side more than on the productivity side. I just want to learn from your That's experience. That's very true. And I think one of the challenges we have in Australia is small businesses, small and medium enterprises. And that's, that's maybe helpful. Where they, they have taken that step to develop a website, but they haven't gone so far as to be purely digital. Um, and one of the programs I mentioned was designed to try and assist that, to take the next step so that things were ordered online and, and um, logistics were done online and delivered online. But our main challenge in Australia is small and medium enterprises um, being able to see uh, the benefits of that investment for them. Uh, at the second kind of um, agenda, which is we are asking our local expert, we, we identify three of us as the first, uh, first players to give kind of comment what kind of regulatory regime or environment would like to see uh, moving for Thailand in the, into the future. Uh, we are inviting Kun Chong Song, Kun Norling and Kun Wichau to be a kind of kicker for this, for this uh, you know, session. Kun Chong Song, do you have anything to add? What kind of thing that we should uh, pave the way for, for digital economy to, to grow on in the future? Digital economy in my view, which I used to talk with Your Excellency. I see digital as a tool to improve the efficiency of our economy. So by conceptually, I think this is important and inevitable. We have to move our country toward digital economy. However, in doing things, we also need to look into the context 
of our country. It reminds me over 20 years ago when we were discussing about privatization of telecom industry in Thailand. I also attend the UK case in UK and study a lot of the case that happened in the world. Even though the concept is, is, is sure, sure good, surely good, but the implementation uh, should be based on the context of each country. In our case, in my view, I think in the country, the private sector and the public sector, all the service, in my sense, uh, should be based on the private sector in order to open the choice for the consumer to choose. And by having that thing, the private sector need to compete each other and then improving of the efficiency, quality, and many of the things. Whereas public sector has a very important role in terms of setting up the master plan for the future, as, as well as the regulation. We cannot let the market competing freely without intervention to make sure that the competition in the market is competing fairly. So in this sense, I think what we should do is to compose the master plan of the country, the role of the private sector in providing services to the consumer, to the people, the role of the public sector in issuing the regulation as well as providing the service from the government part to the people of the country, which cannot be done by the private sector. So uh, I think get together between public sector and private sector and looking into what we are having in our hand right now, and then we extend from that, would be a good place to start for the master plan. Thank you. I, I can assure you that what is being done well by the private sector, we, we will leave it that way. We will add, just add on the things that, you know, is not being handled well by the private sector. Anyway, in, in our, as you may know our plan as we're moving, I announce my plan all the way. If you see any defect in my plan, please give me a call, okay? Yes. On, allow me to move on to Kun Norling. Um, and then Kun Vichau, please, Kun Norling. Oh, Your Excellency, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I think it's very good. It's very important that uh, the Thai government drives a very clear digital economy agenda. I think uh, both uh, DTEC as an operator, but also the other operators, uh, really support of that agenda. And we share also a lot of the same ambitions. Uh, our main ambition is to enable all Thai to connect to the internet via the mobile. That's our main ambition, that's what we work with every day. And already 60% of our subscribers are using the internet via the mobile. In three years time, it's gonna be more than 80%. So this development is fast. And um, I have to say, Thai love the internet. It's a huge demand. Uh, in studies we made this, uh, on average, Thai spend three hours a day on the internet, which is quite a lot and mainly on social media. Line, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, especially Line, I would say. It's a lot of Line going on in Thailand. <laughs> so it's a huge uh, uh, demand, uh, and the only way to meet the, that demand uh, is with the 4G technology. And we are building fully. Uh, but to build efficiently and to meet that demand, we need spectrum. And uh, that's why it's very good now that we're gonna have upcoming 4G auctions in Thailand, end of this year. But still, I have to say, that's a start. More spectrum will be needed, I can assure you. <laughs> so it's very important also after this auction that we see a very clear and timely spectrum auction roadmap, also for new spectrum that's gonna come up. And I assure you, if we have the spectrum, we're gonna build 
big time. Uh, and uh, like I said, it's a huge demand for, for mobile internet and mobile data. Thank you. Well, I can assure you that we have the same aim of having the internet access to every household. Uh, I have no problem with Bangkok or in big cities, but I still have uh, to think about a remote area where they are very poor and they cannot have the machine. I'm even thinking of the uh, center at the village level where we provide you know, machine for them so they can have access to this. And this center can be a good center for, for old age people too. In a very remote area, or age people will like to gather in, 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 in certain place. Yeah, I'm thinking of that model. If, if we put in that you know, place where the old age people you know, are getting together, we put a machine there so it have get access to this. This would be a, a plus point. No, no problem with big cities and, and Bangkok at all. But I can assure you that. Yes. May I ask <coughs> Jeremy about your, your, your points? on the infrastructure policy is made by and uh, intervened by the government, not Ofcom. Oh, yeah. And uh, another question is that, are you really successful in doing functional separation and level playing field for infrastructure sharing? It's a really good question uh, about whether we are successful, whether the functional separation has been successful. And I'm pleased to tell you that Although I don't know the answer, Ofcom last month launched a review of uh, digital communications markets, uh, a large part of which will be asking about the, uh, our perception of success and what we think the next step should be in relation to oversight of the, uh, of the incumbent, of BT. Uh, so although I cannot say today, towards the end of this year, we will be uh, publishing our conclusions, I think, uh, about functional separation and its, uh, its merits and its effectiveness over the preceding decade. So not today, but later this year, we'll be able to give you a good answer. Thank you. So um, let, let us con continue. Um, also, could we shall you have any um, comment? Because you, you are one of the cable provider as well how you see the trend in spectrum and um, cable is coming into play? Talking about the uh, digital economy and people saying that digital economy is basically an uh, internet economy or the new economy or any other terms. But it suffice to say always related to internet and uh, more specifically perhaps is high speed internet or broadband internet. And uh, since Kun Sombasong and Kun Lars and myself are from the telecom industry, we will go down to a more uh, specific areas. And before I go to that one, I'd like to share just a little story. You look at in our region, particularly in Asia, you know, the ones that are very advanced, for example, Japan and Korea, and to a certain degree, uh, our neighbor, uh, Singapore. You know, uh, you look at Japan and, and uh, Korea, the, the, the digital uh, literacy and that sort of things way exceed North America, way exceed Europe and that sort of thing. It just have a couple of characteristics. Number one, in terms of fixed broadband, the speed on a per user basis is very high, minimum 100 meg. Minimum, it's not maximum, minimum 100 meg. At the meantime, from a wise broadband perspective, the operators, they are using spectrums, which are huge. Each operator has 60, 70, or 100 max each. You might, you might need like 15 or 20 max for a 2G operation. You probably need about 30 meg or whatever for 3G or whatever. If you want to go to 4G, you need 50 or 60 meg to make it reasonable. Now, if you look at from another perspective, they were saying that the countries that are really advancing and actually can leapfrog other people is looking at the OTT operators and their market cap. 
you look at the top 15 OTT companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, and those things, the top 15, 11 of those are from the US, four from China, none from other countries. Now we come to China. I want to give you a nice example. We'll go to China. Uh, just look at, there are a lot of stories, but I just want to, since we talk about the, the high speed and the broadband side. China Mobile alone has more than 100 meg of spectrum. The other operators have closed 100 meg. Now come to Thailand. Uh, from an operator perspective, Thailand has a lot of unused spectrums sitting there doing absolutely nothing. You look at 850 uh, from the 800 band, you have quite a few left. You look at 1800 band, you have tons of them left. <laughs> None used. You look at 2300 and 2600, you have 100 max left. So we are talking about we're going to auction 20 max, <laughs> maybe 30 max. Why don't you auction 200 max? <laughs> and you why maybe four or five operators. You know, you look at the current landscape for the operators, you have AS, definitely show interest. DTAC, definitely show interest. We show interest. 3BB show interest. We have two other state enterprises, CAT and TOT. You've got lots of competition. Come out with tons of spectrums. We can easily come out with 150 or 200 megs to the auction. Easily. And do it once. Do it right away. I believe this government has the power and has the guts to do it if we need to. Need to. So, since we're running a short time, I'll start with that. We have lots of things we can talk about. I think I have to throw it to Tiffy as well. Kumishai just has a lot of customers, and you know, it's a federation of everybody who are in ICT. What, what is your comment? What, what should we need to move forward um, for this one? For this digital economy to 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 get realized. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. And um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we we've been expecting um, a lot to happen with the new government initiative on, on the digital economy. Uh, frankly speaking, I, I think to see any success, we need to have enough time to implement the policy uh, with careful uh, implementation with a lot of clear roadmap in order to achieve what we want to achieve. Um, and also we need to make sure that our people understand, the Thai people understand the benefit of this policy, what they're going to get from all level, um, not only just the government level, the incumbent operator, business people, but the consumer and the layman people, they need to understand. And I, I think that's a lot of work that need to, to be done in the next few years. I don't expect this can you know, see any hard evidence in a very short coming period of time. But with the government right uh, initiative and also um, I support a very clear blueprint, a blueprint on the on the plan how it should be implemented, and we also need the continuity of the government support of the, of the program because, you know, in Thai context again, we see the discontinuity of the the follow up on the policy that we initiate, and digital economy is a new name but the old whiskey in a new bottle. We're talking about national broadband policy. We're talking about uh, creative economy policy. We're talking about a lot of new idea to enhance the, the using the technology to enhance the, 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 the well-being of the Thai citizen. But we failed to deliver or implement it over the last many, many years. I think this time, I fully hope that, well, this government can initiate the policy and implant it within Thailand blueprint for the next 
10 years or at least 20 years to make sure that we follow up and we follow through no matter if we change the government to new election or any kind of uh, the transformation. But most also important that we also need to allocate resources we need to implement this policy successfully. Uh, it's the people, the budget in terms of financial support, the spectrum, or the resources, or even the soft infrastructure that uh, His Excellency mentioned, the law in this country. You know, we, we need to ensure that we have the law that support the success of this policy. Because as Professor Stam may understand, we're changing this country law so often, and it's last very really short time and we keep changing it. It seems like we never change because the law keeps changing, but the context of the law remain the same because then we, we go back to the, the same loophole that we cannot do this, we cannot do that, we cannot change this, we cannot change that because of the law. Um, I hope that this time around we, we can look at the 30, 360 degree of what must be done in order to deliver the successful digital economy. This is what I like to see. So, thank you. One of the results of the um, this kind of roundtable, um, Edda will produce the um, um, paper which kind of summarize all, all the position and also you see it's, it will be evidence in, in the um, internet as well. So this is kind of policy legislation with, with, it, with the public. That's first and second it will be kind of we will not we the EDA will issue the, the consultative paper on digital economy policy. Um, and is there any other comment on the table that, that we, we will Tom. be more than welcome? Tom, please. Well, I shouldn't speak, but I will. Uh, and if I get in trouble, I'll have to come back to Thailand and, and beg for work. Uh, but uh, a couple of things that, and I, I had nothing prepared, but I was just jotting down a couple of thoughts while His Excellency was speaking. I want to say a couple of things. One, in terms of um, regulation and government intervention, um, with all due respect, I, I believe that the regulator or the government per se should only intervene where there's massive market failure. I think the best case scenario is to allow the internet to run free and wild. I think it's clear that GDP and broadband capacity are married. But to ma gain maximum benefit from this broadband capacity and to have that contribute maximally to your GDP, I think you have to embrace the internet. Um, I think there's a fear factor that exists all over the world. And I'll give you a Canadian example. You know, and, and it's, it, our uh, content producers were very concerned by OTTS, right? Over the top services were coming in the Netflix of this world and the YouTubes of this world, um, and they felt a real threat. And they asked us to act and impose some kind of conditions and contributions to Canadian content and so on and so forth. And we held our ground because, as I was mentioning earlier, the regulator and or the government's role is to act in the greatest public interest and to allow the free market, to the extent that it's possible, to do what it does best, and that is innovate and invest. And we told them that if you, with these technological disruptions, come tremendous opportunities. And it behooves the industry to do what it has to do to compete on that playing field. Because as I mentioned earlier, we can no longer hermetically seal our borders as it regards content or anything else for that matter. So you have to compete on a global stage. And you have to change your mindset. And this is a great room, think big room, from thinking small and sometimes as Canadians living next to this entertainment powerhouse, which is the US, the sort of superpower of entertainment, you see yourself as a victim. And you have to change the mindset and try to see yourself as a victor. I, off, I also use the same quote of seeing yourself as, as, as a conqueror and not conquered. Go out there, compete, and put your best foot forward to do so. 
So I think if you want to gain maximum benefit from the internet and from a digital economy, uh, you have to embrace it and not fear it. And there can't be protectionism or censorship because all you're doing is curtailing or holding back the tremendous potential that the internet offers the entire world. And when you talk about uh, a single digital market, well, that's exactly what we're talking about. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. The correlation between, cap with, between broadband capacity and GDP. The second thing is, is the importance of creating the balance between incenting industry to invest, and it requires massive capex, as we all know. Um, and in Canada, we, 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 we're, we're looking at Australia and saying, wow, you know, this $40 billion investment is absolutely amazing. Well, as they say in Texas, that dog ain't going to hunt. So Canada is not going to invest $40 billion to lay down pipe. It's going to be private money doing that. And that private money needs a return on investment. So you have to create the environment and create that balance. And I'm sitting, I have a banker to my left here. Um, so you have to create that balance that will motivate industry to continue to invest for the betterment of the economy and GDP growth, while at the same time making sure, and this is the only time when government or regulators should intervene, when there is some kind of market failure and the consumer is being unduly uh, overcharged for services by creating this competitive environment where other people can use the networks often laid down by the incumbents uh, to create this more competitive environment. So that's the second issue. The third issue in terms of government services, again, there's nothing really to fear there. And I'll give you a great example. I was in Greece last week. And Greece is a great and a horrible example at the same time. Okay, So I was in a government office, and there must have been some Commodore 64s, I mean, some kind of old banged up computers with the big screens that were this big. And as I looked at 20 people doing the work that one person could do, and an entire room filled with paper, nothing but paper in the room, a room this big filled with paper, to do really mundane tasks that could probably be done by one person, that's inefficiency at its finest. That's how you get a public service in Greece that went from 300,000 to a million. A million, the whole population is only 10. That's 10% of the population. The active population, probably 20%. A million bureaucrats do not create wealth. And you need to create wealth to pay bureaucrats. And you need to create wealth to offer services, education, infrastructure, and everything else that a modern dynamic equo economy requires. But they were too scared to go down to one public servant, so they have 20 people doing something that one person could do. And we see an example of where that leads today. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll have to wait and see. And finally, the whole rural versus urban question that was raised. And when you look at the UK, and you look at a population of about 70 million in what is relatively uh, very small geographic territory as compared to Canada, which has the second greatest geographic surface um, in the world with 35 million of us. And we're being generous, probably. Um, so you can see the challenge we have. Now, if the UK government is investing 500 billion pounds per annum, um, not even per annum, is that over five years? total over sort of, what, the next 100 years? Uh, so you can imagine what kind of investment that would require in a country like Canada and these massive spaces uh, to offer the kind of speeds that you need. And, and, and my son's a gamer, he's 17 years old, and we're lucky we've got 250 uh, megabits per second coming into the house. But that's fiber to the, to the prem, right? So um, the question there is, and it's very hard to get an answer for that question, should the urban areas subsidize the rural areas? And where is it fair or unfair? Put it to you differently. If I chose to live in the middle of Australia, which is a lovely desert, 
Am I entitled to the same bandwidth and the same cost as the people that live along the coast? It's tough, and, and His Excellency spoke to the fact that he'd like to offer it to the smallest of villages. But who's going to pay for that? Ultimately, it's going to be the people that are buying uh, these services. So there's a balancing act there as well. So my only ultimate message is, and it's the same message we give Canadians um, when they're scared of YouTube and Netflix and everyone else out there that is maximizing this uh, amazing technology, um, is you have to embrace it and go with it and milk it for all it's worth. But for you to do that, you have to, and you have no choice but to let it go and to minimize government intervention. So for what it's worth, thank you.